we were talking about a treatment that's hopefully going to change the whole life of the patient. Going to treat the epilepsy and cure it. Fellow Homo sapiens, this week on Epilepsy Sparks Insight, we have a follow-on from last week's chat with Moran Rubenstein from Tel Aviv University in Israel and Eric Kramer from Université de Montpellier in France about the possible implementation of their epilepsy research findings and how it could possibly improve people's quality of life, their cognition and cause a reduction in seizures and then their next steps into gene therapy for people with epileptic encephalopathies and autism. So, Moran, could you tell us, how shall your findings from your work be used in treatments for people with Dravet? So, so far we've been working in Dravet mice, and what we wanted to target right from the beginning is treatment for Dravet after a seizure onset. So we didn't want a treatment that will have to be uh, given before onset, but rather after. And we tested two age groups in the mice at the beginning when the seizure starts and also in, order mi in older mice after about two weeks that they had spontaneous seizures. In a mice, in, in a human that will be an equivalent to about two or three years. And what we saw is that we can inject this gene therapy in, in young mice and also young adult mice. And we see improvement in the epilepsy. We see reduction in the number of seizures. We see improved survival. We see a reduction in the number of interictal spikes. We also saw improvement in global brain function, so that points to improvement of other comorbidities other than the epilepsy in Dravet. We saw improvement in cognitive functions, in some cognitive functions, and we think that actually this can be a treatment also for uh, adult Dravet patients. And that was something that was important for us to be able to give the treatment once the diagnosis is confirmed, so there is enough time to see how the seizure phenotype is developing, how the comorbidities are presenting, and then come in and correct it. So are you saying that, that um, according to your research, the treatment would be suitable for very young children with seizure onset, and then, but also people who may be in their 20s who have Dravet as what well? What we think so far is yes. There was maybe some benefit to injection in young mice, but there was clear improvement also in adult mice. And I'm not sure that the larger effect in the younger mice was actually because we started the treatment earlier, because there, there is also the natural improvement in, in Dravet epilepsy over time. So I, I don't know if the correction was actually the treatment in the earlier age, or the fact that the disease progression is different and changes over the development of a mouse life. This potential treatment, is it solely suitable, or hopefully, for um, Dravet patients, or could it be used in other types of rare epilepsies or genetic diseases? So the idea that uh, this particular tool, so we spoke briefly about the patent, so the patent has to be about a specific a drug that would contain uh, the gene or the coding sequence that's defective in Dravet syndrome. If you want to use these tools, these viral vectors, as drugs for other diseases, then you would have to change the sequence coding within the, uh, the, the vector. This is very easy. We have standard uh, tools now that we can swap in and swap out and put anything we want inside these vectors. So the tools that we're working with, these uh, canine adenovirus vectors, uh, they're ideally suited for diseases that are caused by genes that are very, very large. So we have the possibility of putting in huge amounts of DNA in these uh, vectors and then uh, controlling them as we like uh, with all the modern tools that are possible now. So we have an enormous amount of flexibility. So the tools can be used uh, particularly for a lot of uh, degenerative diseases of the central nervous system. This particular one is primarily targeted for Dravet syndrome. If you were going to alter the treatment, would you have to get another patent in order to do that? Uh, that's a very good question. Not necessarily. It would be an add-on on to this patent that's already uh, existing. So you would add you know, different uh, um, claims in the patent. So they could be separate, 
depending on the, the marketing strategy and the, depending on the interest in the pharmaceutical company because you can sell parts of patents you can sell uh, you know different items within it but um, you know this is this is not something that Moran or I uh, are involved in at any level so the point really is that I my perception of this is that uh, pharma companies should be interested in um, your patent not solely for drug A patients but potentially for patients experiencing other rare epilepsies or neurodegenerative diseases. That's definitely true yeah in, in the case of uh, they're called channelopathies because the proteins that make a hole in the membrane of the cell and allow certain ions to pass these are typically very, very large genes and they're involved in a lot of different disorders, including other epilepsies and autism also. So this is something that Moran and I are in the process of exploring also with that and another partner in the United States. That's really exciting. Oh, I shouldn't get too excited because <laughs> because this is a really, really long process and I know we don't know if it's going to get to, you know, to the end after all these different tests and how many years it may take. but. I'm sorry, I can't help it. I'm really excited, <laughs> excited by your work. What about access to this uh, potential treatment? Can you give people a a sort of potential timeline? Is that possible? Let's start with the safety issues. We're talking about a treatment that's going to be hopefully going to change the whole life of the patients, going to treat the epilepsy and cure it. But we have to make sure that it's safe. And we have to make sure that it's safe for, for the long term. So we did all of these controls in mice now. And we injected this gene therapy treatment in uh, healthy mice. And so far, we didn't see any adverse effects. However, going from mice to treating patients, there is a long gap there. And within this gap, we have to make sure that the treatment is absolutely safe. So it's not immediate uh, and it's going to involve a lot of safety tests, a lot of further developments. Yeah, I would also add on to that the fact that, uh, as, uh, as I mentioned initially, this is, is a beta version. We didn't expect this version to work so well and so quickly. So we think we can even make it better. So these are the, the things. So once we change this drug, even the smallest changes by targeting different populations of neurons. We'll have to go back and redo all the tests again in mice. We'll have to retest it in monkeys. We'll retest it in everything. So uh, we want to get the therapy that's the most suitable and the most powerful to do this one-off uh, type of approach because we believe or we hope is that once uh, the, the vector is injected into the brain, that the other treatments uh, that the patients have to undergo can be reduced or eliminated. That's obviously the, uh, the, the idea, to treating the disease at the cause and not the symptoms. So we're going to be treating the, the problems with the connections with the neurons in the brain. We're going to stop the epilepsy, which in turn, all this excitement in the brain is causing the other problems downstream and all the other uh, cognitive effects. So. Uh, there's a long way to go. It's very complicated. Uh, we've had fantastic results so far, but we think we can even do better. So uh, we're at that stage now. So and another thing to consider is that there is a huge size difference when we're talking about the size of the mouse, of the mouse brain and the size of the child's brain. And with gene therapy, there is no way that we can target all the neurons, not even in mice. So part of the work that we're doing now is trying to understand where we should inject this virus and what kind of neurons we have to hit in order to get this global effect. Eric had a great analogy for that. So the, the, uh, the analogy that uh, Moran and I were speaking about before is that the brain is a village of 10,000 people. So if you can only uh, in modify a certain number of the people in this village. Say you only have to modify 200 or, or 50. Who are the ones you want to modify? Do you want to modify the police? Do you want to modify the mayor's office? Do you want to modify the teachers in the school? Who is going to have the most influence in this community to affect the function of this village or the brain? Is it going to be the high school students? 
that are going to develop and integrate into the system later on. So these are, are the ideas that we still don't know. And this goes back to the idea of when to treat and how long uh, do we need to treat. It's not impossible that if a child is treated at one years old and he has uh, correction and no more epilepsy, that the downstream effects that are associated with the cognitive decline can be prevented. So our hope is, you know, to stop, uh, prevent, or cure the disease with a one-off type of approach. So it's, uh, we need to know who we need to modify in that context. And that is the real question. We still don't know which population of people in this village will be the most influential to, to modify. I really relate to, a, I love your analogy, because I've often thought, in, in my own specific situation, gosh, if I'd have had more effective treatment at a younger age, would that have potentially stopped my seizures, focal seizures from becoming secondary generalized tonic clonic? and then mucking up my brain even further. And that could possibly have been the case if I'd have had surgery at an earlier date. So I guess it's quite similar to that. So people who are not necessarily familiar with their Dean gene therapy, like you know 99.9% .9 of the population, um, and uh, the rarer epilepsies, hopefully, uh, well, this provides you with a bit of uh, insight there. No, I, I agree totally with that. This is, these are some of the black boxes that, uh, you know, uh, Moran and her uh, group and, uh, are trying to understand at the moment, the, the fundamental causes and the downstream effects of the initial seizure mm. induction. So. Mm. I'm just imagining in the future some really happy pa parents <laughs> as well. Um, it's important to note that the epilepsies can be equally as impactful on the families and the carers as on the, the child. Or, or the grown up and the, and again as I've mentioned in other podcasts we might not be as cute necessarily as adults but li the lives of people affected are equally as important as those of children so uh, what are the next steps for you uh, you know and you working with the pharma industry uh, regarding the gene therapy for people with um, epileptic encephalopathies and autism and Dravet as a whole so we just got the patent that's very new to us. It was a hard process getting so far. And we are now working to publish the paper and uh, announce this discovery to the scientific community. Uh, we're hoping to team up with pharmas down the road and uh, get their input on how to take this forward. And maybe also not only for Dravet, as Eric mentioned before, but also to other epilepsies that are caused by a large gene and, and maybe even autism. There's a lot of uh, resources available to public uh, research foundations, the Tel Aviv University, the CNRS, and, the, uh, and at the European level also. So there are, you know, the governments are doing their uh, job by providing us access to the people that know how to bring these types of drugs to the market. So well, we count on the support from them, uh, the European Union, France, I Israel, all the national governments are, are having input on this also. So uh, the next step is obviously for us to continue to engage uh, these services, continue to try to move these therapies forward. And if we can't find pharmaceutical companies, it's possible to do this at the government level also for rare orphan diseases. So we're trying to push every uh, button to try to identify the next step uh, and the next partners that uh, to move this therapy forward. So it's a long, complicated process that neither Moran nor I or nor the member of our group who are actively involved. Also, I don't want to slight them by thinking that uh, it's just Moran and I, because they're, without them, we do nothing either. Uh, but. It's a whole a long process that we count on a lot of people and a lot of expertise from enormous number of sources. So this incredible work was actually done by wonderful students in the lab. And this project is led by a brilliant PhD student, Saja Fadila, with the help of all the other students in the lab. And I'm, I'm just mentioning a few, Anat Mavashov, Marina Bruzel, and Karen Anderson. And they all work very hard to, to show how this affects how effective this treatment is and also improving it further. Certainly, these are the, the heart and soul of the project. Uh, Beth Hongrichet is the one who's been designing these tools uh, uh, and has invested enormous amount of 
both energy and intellectual capacity into the projects and making these tools uh, uh, as good as they are. Iria Gonzalez has been also involved testing uh, the different tools, testing the different uh, triggers that turn on these tools uh, and combined with the lab of Moran, uh, we've made an excellent team. Uh, it's been a pleasure working with the whole consortium at the moment. Well, I personally also thank everybody mentioned from the heart and uh, I look forward to hearing, and no doubt listeners and viewers look forward to hearing more and more about their work and how that contributes to the people affected by the epilepsies. Thank you again. Thank you, Tori. To learn more about Moran and Eric, check them out using the links below where you can find other links to their profiles and their work. <laughs>